Um, the next speaker is T.A. Sayers. He was good enough to come and talk to the seminar last year about the efforts in the Bay of Plenty to protect areas of sea and islands. Um, and he's here this year to give us an update on how that project's gone. Um, kia ora no tato. Uh, yeah, um, nga mihi ki te mana whenua uh, and, and the mana moana o, uh, o tēnei rohe. Um, I, most of you are at a privilege here. Uh, do I have a clicker? No clicker? Sorry, the clicker doesn't work. Okay, so no clicker. Okay, so we'll, we're just going to check that. Is yeah. the microphone on? Oh, I, it's not on, but is it on? Is it on? No, I don't think it's on. I'll just speak really loudly. Is that okay? Yeah. No. Um, so uh, most of you are very um, fortunate because you've already been exposed to this journey last year. Uh, so I'm probably going to just race through for the ones that haven't or are new to what we've been doing at our Motu um, in the Bay of Plenty, uh, is so that you guys get a bit of an overview, and then. We've recently had a uh, very successful time at the Court of Appeal, and um, that, and then we can focus on that. And then hopefully we'll have about five or ten minutes for for some Q and A. So uh, diving right in, um, this is obviously our myriad, our what restoration of our moana looks like, and then. Um, this is what happens after it gets um, opened up to intensive activities. So to give a few objectives, we will be touching on uh, marine spatial planning and the use of the Resource Management Act, uh, which we have initiated through um, the court processes of the Coastal Environment Plan. Uh, so this is Mōtiti. Mōtiti is a, um, a beautiful place. It is a place dear to me. It is where I fuck a papa from. It is basically the embodiment of everything that I am now, past and future, as our Matua Tautoko had quoted all about earlier today. Um, so in terms of the paipairoa or the outreach in um, area of our rohe, we have two marine reserves already in the Bay of Plenty, one at um, Tuhua Island uh, and the other one at, uh, um, or near Fakati Island um, or White Island. Uh, and Mōtiti sits there in the middle and this is to give a bit of an orientation around that. We need to understand that our community is made up of sectors and interest groups and those interest groups and sectors uh, have obviously varied ideas about their relationship with the moana, but I don't think it should dis discourage us from sharing a taonga relationship or a treasured relationship with our ocean. And by that, I mean that gives us the opportunity to collectively share something significant with our marine space, whether it's with our seabirds or whether it's with our deep sea creatures. Because at the moment we are facing, as we've just heard from Eden, a massive um, degradation or degrading process in our rohe moana. Uh, and this pretty much highlights it because we are driving the complexity of our rohe down to the, uh, the less complex from those large macrofauna. And then if we touch into uh, the hidden truths, well, it's all changed, hasn't it? Uh, and it's due to industrial activities that have taken place over the last 50 or 60 years, which is how long uh, our kaumatua and, and queers have been asking for protections to be put in place around our rohe. Because we have lost our, well, our taonga. These hapuku have disappeared, and they have disappeared from this rohe of the Waitamata, and they have disappeared across the east coast of New Zealand the frequency and quality and condition of these have diminished significantly around New Zealand. And this is what it looks like in uh, commercial terms, uh, and as you can see, that is near extinction. And that is because of this inappropriate bottom trawling that has destroyed our rohe, but this is probably very similar to what you have experienced up here. And so in order to ascertain what has happened, 
uh, and to reconcile how we can take control of that, we need to understand how all the different resource management landscape looks like, and it's rather complex. But then we can drill it down to these. And if we drill it down to these, we find that uh, there are some easy targets that we can start to focus on. I mean, the Fisheries Act, you would think, would be a great place to work with. The Marine Reserves Act is something that many of you are probably quite familiar with. Marine Life, uh, uh, Wildlife Act, uh, Marine Mammals Protection Act, they all these provide some form of protective qualities that can be enabled into uh, providing for restoration of our marine space. We took some models from what had already been before us, and obviously Ngāti Kanohi had a complementary model called the Taonga Suite that they had developed, and then we went to a uh, more, well, a slightly different complex of uh, marine protection that was actually created around Tuhua and used those understandings. It all started with actually building a public profile for the need for marine protection, which we based around obviously the tragedy of the MV Rena, which we heard a little, touched on a little bit earlier. And basically we as a community got together with a whole heap of other parts of our community and said, actually it'll be really good to put in place some protective measures for the future because we saw on that first slide a myriad of opportunities with all of those life forces being there. So we proposed that we would have a one nautical mile um, buffer zone around Otaiti and protect it under the section 186 of the Fisheries Act. We failed and it's because of the fundamental uh, purpose of the Act and that is because Te Tauotaiti, or Astrolab Reef, is a um, wahi tapu to us, and we weren't really interested in fishing it. And when we went to the Fisheries Act to have that conversation, uh, they said, but you're not interested in fishing it because you're talking about everything else but fishing. And we said, yeah, but we just want you to stop killing it. And they turned around and they said, well, we can't help you. So we went, well, if you can't help us, then someone else must. And that's where we started, that's where we launched into the Resource Management Act declaration in 2015, which we won. And then we won those values on intrinsic values, landscapes, Māori culture that is beyond the act of fishing and biodiversity and habitat. Because fundamentally the Fisheries Act is limited. It is a limited act because it is only there to control the act of fishing, it is not there for the sustainabilities of the environmental context that the fish live within. Now, another point is the stakeholder groups in the Fisheries Act are those with consideration, those that have a, um, a quota holders, per se, and um, even though quota really doesn't exist anymore, it was just something to establish everything with, but that's a technical matter and we could probably dive into that if there are questions. Um, and in essence, it also created the regulations. But what I'd just like to make is this point here. See that nice straight line? This is snapper one, this is our brohe, and this is what MPI says they've done to it. So if you see the nice flat line, that basically means they've been extracting the same level all the way through. That's called sustainability. They, but this is what the environmental modelling actually says. And this is, and just note that that was presented to the court and actually sits on the back of our court judgment as to why it was a necessity to have these in place. So coming back to our rohe, um, this, is more to, oh, this is more titi in the middle here. This is the natural environment area which we produced in the um, regional coastal policy statement. And here you can see the outstanding natural features uh, that we have within our Rohe Moana and basically we created this space as a distinct space to be able to have the qualities recognised as a taonga for all New Zealanders. So the Attorney General obviously wasn't happy with, um, with the fact that we had won our declaration so he decided to take us to the High Court and we won again. So then we went off to go to, the, um, to our merits case to now get the provisions for those um, restrictions on the inappropriate activities. And so everything that you see in pink 
are our wahi tapus represented with an ecological or biological buffer zone around the toka tapu that they, that they exist. And everything in yellow on this map is, a, uh, is what we consider our wahi taonga, where we believe that the appropriateness of activities should re remove activities that destroy or remove large, vast areas of marine life and fauna used by the use of nets, pots and dredges. And we won. Because when you fundamentally want to talk about this in a cray pot, you're in the Fisheries Act. When you want to talk about this, our toka, you're in the Resource Management Act. The value between these two is purpose, sustainability of fishing, or the act of fishing, purpose, landscape, intrinsic values, biodiversity, habitat, everything else. So the court then issued and declared that within these three areas, those outstanding natural features that we saw on the, on the other map, would now have the prohibition of the destruction of flora and fauna because these are wahi tapu. And these wahi tapu here have a significant spiritual relationship to us as people and collectively we can all share in the sacredness of that opportunity to preserve, restore and acknowledge that the sacrifice of this will provide for future generations. And so inside that now we have our wahi tapu or our sacred space collectively as New Zealanders our wahi taonga, our treasured moana, collectively as New Zealanders, protected from inappropriate activities. Because what we know is that inside marine reserves, they create productivity. Outside marine reserves, they don't create so much productivity. So this gives a bit of a highlight of the process that we've been through, because we're going through so we're going to need to transition restoration over the, over the very near future and take a more landscaped and ecoscaped approach in terms of progressing what will be a pathway to a restored management regime. We may be able to use the elements of ecosystem-based management uh, but we are still working through what is ecosystem-based management at an academic level, and this is something that may take longer than the precautionary approach that we need to preserve what we've got left. In terms of the pathway to, that we went on and strategies, uh, right here we have the development. Um, so firstly, start developing a strategy. Secondly, know your subject. Thirdly, be issue driven. Fourthly, be propositionary. Fifthly, understand your limitations because guess what? We're not all things, to all things, so we've all got limits somewhere. Um, understand the stakeholders that are involved in your restoration project. Uh, understand the governance, regulation, and framework. Understand the networks and allies that you can have. Working together actually makes the job lighter. Uh, cost, benefit, risk analysis, uh, implementation, and review, review, and obviously start again. <laughs> because we are fundamentally on a race to the extraction of biodiversity around the world, but in particular we are seeing it in our blue backyards. And I'll leave that part of the presentation to, with this note because um, it's really something that we must always remember that we are all tied together like threads weaved in amongst it and, uh, and that relying on each other to be part of that story is so much more important to the story. Now to obviously the recent um, Court of Appeal and how much we won, we essentially so I don't really have slides for this because we're actually still working through the appeal period, so 
hush, nobody <laughs> go any further because um, we will find out on Monday if we're going to the Supreme Court. It is unlikely, though, that we will be going to the Supreme Court because guess what? The Attorney General won because it's actually law. <laughs> it was law beforehand, it's law now. It's been law basically for the last 16 years. And I suppose that's probably what's so fundamental is that for the last 16 years, our regional authorities, our Department of Conservation has failed to give effect to the conventions of biodiversity and has continued to obstigate or to ignore its duties, responsibilities to these values and we are now in a place where we are at a crisis in our marine space. So I'm going to open the floor up to questions after that wild road of that, <laughs> that we've just been on and, um, and actually give you guys an opportunity to actually pick my brain. I will just make a, a caveat right now. Go and seek your own legal advice if you're going to exercise any precedent don't just rely on the hearsay of some joker that's just standing in the front of your room. All right, where you, you go? You want to... <laughs> on the Q and A, like two we've, or three questions. We've or... only, yeah, we've only got a three limits of time, but a couple of questions would be great. I, one one thing I think needs to be stressed is that T A and his fellow advocates have really opened a massive can of worms for environmental protection in New Zealand. They have... Opportunity. Opened <laughs> Better word. We, 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 like, we like the word opportunity because this is, like, this is yeah. our opportunity as a community to start to tap into the, the, what is essentially our, um, our value structure, our values of biodiversity, our values of landscape, our values of culture that we can collectively share. And these all exist. This is nothing new. This is stuff that we've known about as scientists, as people of the world, as an experiential relationship. Sorry, James. No problem. <laughs> um, any questions or comments? Oh. <laughs> That's great. So, so nobody actually wants to know how to do it. <laughs> Where you go. How did you mobilise the community groups yeah. to um, get that action? Yeah, sure. So um, it's really everything's in here. This is the map. This is essentially the synthesis of the 12 steps we went through in order to be able to inform our community, to start sharing the, what was already in existence to give an opportunity that, in essence, you know, building, knowing your own limitations, what, you know, we don't all have money just raining out of the skies, do we? And we don't all have, like, you know, all the time in the world. But if you start to share the load with your allies and you start to network, you can actually find yourself in a, in a much stronger position than what you actually thought. You know, as, as, the, as parts, we aren't as strong, but as the sum, we, we obviously make a, make a big difference. Did that help? Or? Yeah, I was going to ask the same question um, about um, um, getting a mandate to it. And really what, what I see there is maybe as a blueprint for the way we need to address the Hurricane Gulf situation and the way the forum is probably trying to, to uh, and taking in recreation fisheries well, I just want to stop first at the mandate issue. You just mandated your regional councils in the recent elections. They have the mandate to do this. This isn't. This is. I mean, you just you have you as as an, as a concerned citizen of this country that has a relationship and has values, has the opportunity to express them and submit in a process publicly like everyone else in this country. Now the second part of your question about the sectors of fishing, they don't, they have, they have this, they have the Fisheries Act. The sectors of fishing, the Fisheries Act will always protect them. This is why environmental communities have failed to be able to 
make any changes here because, sorry, uh, where was it? Because if we go back to who or what controls fishing, where was it? It was back here. Must be somewhere around there. Uh, there. Because if we go to where the stakeholders are, the stakeholders are actually the ones with consideration. The other, the other quota holders are the ones that are getting paid. They're the ones that actually have an exchange going on. The regulations is where all those other, where all those other controls exist. So within the customary and the recreational regs is where the other controls for the act of fishing, the purpose of fishing. The Resource Management Act doesn't see it like that. Where's, I think it's the next slide. The Resource Management Act sees it where it's not provided for. So they see it as, the Resource Management Act sees it as a singular act collectively called fishing and Basically, they can only provide for, for the purpose, not for fishing. So it can't provide for the purpose, but it can control the effects of fishing on those other values. TA, we might oh, we'll, we'll, we'll call it there. Call it there. Go. Um, really, what 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 TA is talking about is, is quite a profound difference in the way that these acts should be administered, um, and it's going to have a enormous implications over the next 10 years or so and they are really to be congratulated for the really? extraordinary effort. Oh,